Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is good that we might be gathered together for worship today. This truly is a day that the Lord has made. Let us be gl glad and rejoice in it. This is an opportunity we have to create this unique and wonderful community of faith, both gathered here in person in the sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online. Together, a unique and wonderful opportunity to lift our hearts, our minds, our voices in praise to God, and we welcome you for this opportunity to be together today. I do hope that you'll all sign the friendship pads if you are here in the sanctuary. They're usually found on one end of the... in our yellow safety protocols uh, with community transmission levels which here in the sanctuary means you'll see every other pew on the side sections marked off to provide a little extra space for those who might desire that as we've gathered to worship together just encourage all of us that we might be as safe as possible throughout this time that we might continue to gather here together You'll notice throughout this month of July, we are participating in Change for the Church, which means it's a little less casual, or a little more casual, I guess, in terms of our dress, not wearing robes and things up front uh, here in the sanctuary, and also the opportunity to be a part of our special offering for July that helps children who find themselves in need, both here in Fort Mill with school supplies through communities and schools, and then also the children in the refugee camps in in Syria. So we continue to uh, take part in that special offering together. This morning, I was grateful to see so many of you as a part of our Together Again Summer Fellowship at Unity. This morning was one of our uh, special intergenerational activity mornings, and uh, we had a chance to think about our neighbors near and far. Uh, the next one of those is coming up in August, but we do meet every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall for just time to connect with one another in a casual, informal kind of way. So do be sure to come and be a part of that next, um, next Sunday morning. Speaking of next Sunday, next Sunday will be the first day of our next opportunity to host the families with Family Promise. Uh, we are still looking for a few um, overnight volunteers as well as some meal uh, hosts and chaperones for that week. So be sure to speak with Dandy Vaughn or Jennifer Brendesee that you might be a part of our efforts to host Family Promise. Again, that's uh, July the 24th through the 31st. Looking ahead a little farther to the 31st, a special day um, as we will have our next Taze worship service um, in the historic sanctuary that evening at 5 o'clock. That's followed by the Unity Family Fun Night uh, that will begin at uh, 5.30 on the front lawn. And then the following Sunday, August the 7th, is the annual meeting of the congregation. And that'll take place at the clock in between our two worship services. And we'll be here in the sanctuary for that. One more word note is that this coming Saturday, which is July the 23rd, is that we'll be having a memorial service for Unity member uh, Lois Edwards, who passed away over two years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. We were not able to have a public service for Lois at that time, and so we've scheduled that uh, to take place this coming Saturday, July the 23rd at 2 o'clock, and there'll be a reception in the fellowship hall to follow. I encourage you and invite you to come that you might be a part of that time with the Edwards family. At this point, as we have come and gathered to worship, let us stand and uh, call ourselves to worship using the words as we begin with the congregation in Troy.
remain standing and join me in our responsive call to worship. We are like a green olive tree in the house of God. We trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. Thank the Lord because of what God has done for us. In the presence of the faithful, we will proclaim God's name, for it is good. Together, let us worship the living God. be seated. Each time we gather here and we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God the ways that we fall short and we are not living the way we are called to live. And we're able to do this because we trust that God is merciful and just and that God is eager to surround us with grace and with love. Therefore, let us make our confession together, first out loud and then silently. Let us pray. God, our creator, we confess that we are broken, sinful creatures. You made us in your image, but we tarnish your good name. You call us your beloved children, but we take your favor for granted. We say that we want peace and yet continue to
to divide and distort. Forgive us, God of grace. Tear open the heavens and come down. Pour out your spirit of mercy upon us so that we may live in a way that is pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. By his body and his cross, Jesus reconciles all who were once estranged. Hear and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. seated. This morning our first scripture reading is Genesis chapter 8 verses 6 through 12. We join the story of Noah as he, his family, and the animals float upon the waters of the great flood. But the rain has finally stopped. Let us hear the word of the Lord. At the end of 40 days Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him, to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. At this time, let me invite our young friends, the children, to come and spend a few moments together here on the carpet by the steps. If you are at home watching us, I hope that you'll draw near to the screen so that you might be a part of this special time together as well. Good morning. How are y'all today? Good. It is good to see you. Thank you so much for coming up this morning. It is always a better day in worship when you are here. So thank you so much for coming to be a part of our service today. Now the scripture text that we just heard was about Noah and his family while they were floating on the ark, right? Yeah. And guess what they were doing while they were floating there on the waters in the ark? They were just kind of waiting, right? Yeah, just kind of waiting. Do you all like to wait? No, not really. I know, I know, me neither. Like, say, you know that it's almost time, like in a couple days, it's going to be time to go on vacation, but it's not time yet, so you got to wait. How's that feel? 
Not so good, huh? No. How about like if you're in line at the grocery store with your mom or your dad and they've got a great big order, a whole cart full of things, and you've got to wait while they get all checked out. Is that very fun? No, not really. That's right. So, yeah. How about when, um, do you ever have to wait after dinner before you can have dessert? Yeah, that's right. So, so that's not very fun either, is it? No, sometimes you have to wait, right? It's hard. It's hard to wait. And so I was thinking, you know, what was maybe that helped Noah and his family as they were waiting? And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, maybe they were um, okay waiting because they knew that God was going to keep the promises and that something very special was coming, and it was worth waiting, right? And so Noah sends out the dove the first time, and the dove flies around and can't find anywhere to land. So he has to wait seven more days. And then he puts the dove out again, and this time, do you remember what happened when the dove came back? He had a a leaf, right, from an olive tree. So it reminded Noah, guess what? We don't have to wait very much longer. We've got hope because the waters are starting to recede. And it's going to be able, we're going to be able to get out of this ark soon. So they waited another seven days. And he sent the dove out the third time. And this time the dove didn't come back because the waters had receded. And they, he knew that it was going to be time to get out of the ark very, very soon. So I was thinking that maybe we could remember that too. Sometimes when we have to wait, we can remember that God has great things in store and that something like dessert is coming and therefore we can hold on just a little longer because we know that God has good things in store for us. How's that sound? You think we can remember that together? All right. Well, let's pray a little bit and I'll pray first and y'all can repeat after me, okay? Dear Dear God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit Spirit. and for doves. doves. Help us us. when we have to wait to to know that you will always keep your promise. promise. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for coming up today. If you are headed to nursery or children with worship, you get to go with Miss Meredith and a bunch of friends out in the hallway today, and we will surround you with our song of blessing.
For the months of June and July here at Unity Presbyterian Church, we are exploring the Holy Spirit in a series that we're calling Empowered by the Spirit. And each week we will encounter the Spirit through a different biblical image. And today we find the Spirit and the Dove. Throughout Scripture we find references to doves or turtle doves. They were an important part of the sacrificial system in the Jerusalem temple. We heard in our first reading the Genesis account of Noah sending forth a dove from the ark to determine if the waters of the flood had started to recede. However, the most explicit reference to the Holy Spirit and the dove we find is in the accounts of Jesus' baptism. So for our second reading this morning, let us hear God's word to us. It's recorded in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. We'll read verses 9 through 11. Let us hear this word of God. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray as we sing together. Amen. I'm going to tell you something in just a minute that you might not be able to forget. It might forever change your understanding of the scripture text that I just read for you. Now, I recognize that's a pretty big claim, and that this may be something you don't particularly want to know. So if you decide to put your fingers in your ears for a few minutes, I will completely understand. But as I was studying and reading for the sermon this week, I came across a book called Consider the Birds by Pastor Debbie Blue with a chapter about doves in the Bible. And this is where you might want to cover your ears, because I read when she wrote, it is not difficult information to uncover. Nevertheless, I was surprised to find that a dove is, in fact, a pigeon by another name. (laughs) Pigeon is from the French pigeon, and a dove is an English word. There's a great variety of birds that English speakers call either pigeons or doves, but their names are interchangeable. She says this information can be hard to absorb. Yes, that information can be hard to absorb. The Holy Spirit is like a pigeon. That's going to take some getting used to. A pigeon descending upon Jesus at his baptism. As I said, this may forever change how we understand this text. 
And that actually may be a good thing because this new image, at least for me, forced me to dig a little deeper here. Yes, there's a lot more going on in this text than just a little water, an affirmative voice, and a cute bird landing on Jesus' shoulder. Brian Blunt, the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary, suggests he experienced something like what's going on in this text after the birth of his daughter. Those of you who are parents might know what he is talking about. After the birth of a child, everything changes. Your schedule, your habits, how you talk, even the food that you eat change to fit the desires and schedule of this little person who now resides in your home. Dr. Blunt writes, to me it became clear one fateful and instructive December night. There I was, a 38-year-old professor at at the prestigious Princeton Theological Seminary. I stand and lecture before hundreds of students. I stand and preach before great congregations. And yet there I was, crawling on my hands and knees across the carpet of her bedroom floor like a scared rabbit in a futile attempt to escape before she opened her eyes and found me out and sounded her personal piercing cry of alarm. We couldn't domesticate her, he says. We couldn't get her to sleep when we wanted. We couldn't get her to eat like we wanted. A mind-bending, life-altering, change-your-ways kind of force had gotten loose and was running amok in our lives. My friends, that's what Jesus' baptism is like, especially here in the Gospel of Mark. This is no drops running down a cute infant's nose. This is no quiet, gentle breeze experience of the Holy Spirit. This is no sweet, cooing dove. No, as Jesus is coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart. So the first image we find is not a gentle parting of the clouds like a curtain being raised on opening night at a theater or a play. Now, the Greek word that Mark uses here is schizo. It literally means to tear, to rip, or to shred. It's the root of our English word schism, and it is a violent image. And what is it that's being ripped or torn apart? It's the heavens. In ancient Israelite cosmology, the heavens were, again, not someplace in the clouds where God lived and where angels sat around playing harps. No, the heavens were a dome above the earth. They were a buffer, we might even say, created by God to separate the waters above the earth from the waters below the earth. Back in Genesis, when God decides to flood the earth because the wickedness of humans was great in the earth and every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually, when God decides we need to start all over, God opens the windows in the heavens to let the waters of chaos return. It's not an accident that we're talking about both the flood and Jesus' baptism this morning. Because the last time God opened the heavens, the waters returned with a vengeance. The world returned to its pre-creation state so that God could start again. Yes, to tear open the heavens is to disrupt the very fabric of creation, to fundamentally alter the relationship between God and God's creatures, to shatter an essential piece of the cosmic framework that allows life to exist. The heavens keep creation safe. But now, 
as Jesus is coming up out of the water, he sees the heavens torn apart. But what descends this time? It's not the waters of chaos. No, God comes down. Jesus sees the Spirit descending like a dove, like a pigeon upon him. The very presence of God emerges from the heavens. That sounds pretty great to us, right? We love it when God is in our hearts, when God walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. But first century Israelites would not have regarded this as good news. No, God is too holy, is too bright, is too powerful to be present in the world. This buffer of the heavens not only keeps the waters of chaos at bay, it also protects us because no one can look upon God and live. With the heavens torn open and God coming down, the very creation itself is now at risk. As the prophet Isaiah once prayed, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. That's what happens when God comes down. Tearing open the heavens, earthquakes, wildfires. Yes, the Israelites would not have regarded this as good news. In fact, they might even have appreciated a warning I once saw on a highway billboard that was signed God, but said, don't make me come down there. My friends, everything is going to change when God comes down. So the spirit that descends is more like a tiger unleashed from its cage than a sweet cooing dove. Dr. Blunt writes, the scholarly debate that focuses on whether the dove imagery is supposed to demonstrate the bodily form of the spirit, like a bird, or whether it is to suggest the manner in which the dove descends, like a bird, misses the point. Who cares? Mark is less concerned about what it looks like and how it glides than he is about what it does. It infiltrates Jesus. It possesses him. Yes, that's something else we learn if we dig a little deeper into this text. When talking about what the Holy Spirit does to Jesus, Mark does not use the preposition epi, which means upon. No, here Mark uses ace to intentionally say that the Spirit enters into Jesus. Jesus is possessed by God's Spirit. As he's coming up out of the water, Jesus sees the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a pigeon into him. Yes, the spirit descends like a pigeon or a dove. Messengers, birds used as messengers in the ancient world to carry news, maybe news of hope, maybe even gospel good news across great distances maybe even from heaven to earth. The Spirit descends like a pigeon or a dove, birds that somehow always seem to flock together. The Spirit descends like a pigeon or a dove, birds that even today are found everywhere, both in urban settings and rural settings. The Spirit descends like a pigeon or a dove, birds that are persistent and are always underfoot and that can really make a mess out of our ordered spaces and lives. As Pastor Debbie Blue writes, pigeons want to be close to us. They are where we are 
in some of the worst places that we have made our neglected projects and abandoned buildings and some of the best art museums, parks, Romes, piazzas, they won't leave us alone. That's the kind of spirit, the very presence of God that possesses Jesus. It's the kind of spirit that's not going to leave the world alone. The kind of spirit that is going to address the great wickedness of humans in the earth, the evil inclinations of their hearts, but not with fire and brimstone and flood. My friends, no, this spirit is going to bring peace, not by singing kumbaya around a campfire, but with a flood of love that confronts the powers and principalities of this world on a cross. Creating peace by giving his life for you and for me. This is the Spirit of God that does not land gently on Jesus' shoulder. This is the Spirit of God that possesses Jesus. Remember, later his family is going to think that he is crazy. It's the beginning of a new creation. God is here with us, and nothing, nothing in heaven or on earth will ever be the same. My friends, the heavens are torn open. God has come down. The Spirit is unleashed in the world, and not just in Jesus, but in you and in me, in this church, in this community. Something new and life-changing is happening here. And so I leave you this morning with words of the writer Annie Dillard, who said, Why do people in church seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a packaged tour of the absolute? Does anyone have the foggiest idea what kind of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness, she says, to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, tear open the heavens and come down. You are at work in this world. The Spirit is unleashed. Inspire us, challenge us, change us so that we might join and be a part. A part of this world and this work of reconciliation and peace and hope that you bring. Inspire us, O Lord. Fill us with your spirit. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In response to hearing scripture read and proclaimed, may we, as we are able, stand that together we might declare what it is that we believe. Today we use words from the Nicene Creed as they are found printed in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Friends, all that we seek to accomplish, all that we strive to achieve, all that we claim to possess amounts to nothing without the grace of Jesus. And because the grace of Christ has been poured out so abundantly in our lives, let us now respond by bringing to God the tithes and the offerings of our hearts and of our hands. We invite you to prayerfully consider making a financial contribution to the undergird and expand the transformative ministries of this church here and beyond these walls. There are many ways you can give. You can use the QR code in your bulletin. You can give online. You can mail your gift. You can leave it in the box by the historic sanctuary or leave it in the offering plates that are in the North X as you leave worship this morning. But as we have so freely received, let us also freely give. Friends, the psalmist calls us to pour out our hearts before God, for he is our sure refuge and strength. And so let us now unite our hearts in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, when Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, the sky lit up with the voice of the Father. And you, you descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. You descended not as an eagle, powerful and regal, not as a hawk, keen-eyed and quick, not as a sparrow, flitting to and fro, but a dove. You descended on Christ as a meek bird, the sort of bird that the poorest of the poor could afford to sacrifice in a temple. You descended with wings full of peace and hope, too, like the dove that returned to Noah after the six weeks of relenting rain, with a sprig of olive in her beak, extending the hope of life once again. When you descended on Jesus at his baptism, full of meekness and innocence, you anointed him for ministry, not of royal power or military might, but of humility, hope, purity, and peace. And so we pray this day that you would anoint us with these same gifts, Holy Spirit, and send us out wise as serpents and innocent as doves, preparing the way for hope and peace. Jesus, Lord of life, you came among us that we might have life and have it abundantly. Through the Holy Spirit, continue your ministry of peace and hope and healing. Hear us as we name in our hearts those of our family and friends who most need your healing touch. Deliver those who are captive to addictions of both mind and body. Save those who are trapped in destructive and abusive relationships. Send us out. Send us out as your disciples to those who are lonely, who are broken, who are afraid, who hunger and thirst for your good news. Hear us as we continue to pray with one voice the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, as our service of worship concludes, may our lives of worship and service begin anew. As we go forth from this place, may we go knowing the Spirit is unleashed in our hearts, in our lives, in this world. Like a dove, like a pigeon, who comes to make all things new. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen.